Relations between Islam and the West are probably at their lowest point. We have entered into a time of confusion, apprehension, and fear. We are continually told that the world is engaged in a battle between good and evil. The good is civilized, and naturally, the evil is not. The advocates of a clash of civilizations have convinced many people around the globe of a destructive paradigm that ultimately obscures the way that we see and understand the world, especially the Muslim world. Making sense of Islam and relations between the Muslim world and the West requires an understanding of the faith, its history, and its diverse interpretations. While seeking to understand Islam, many non-Muslims still struggle within a vacuum, relying upon stereotypes born of negative and violent headlines. Understanding of this Abrahamic faith, as well as the everyday normal lives of the mainstream Muslim majority, is also obscured by a vocal Muslim minority. Upon hearing their rallying cries, most people cannot be blamed to see Islam as an idiosyncrasy, a moral and social oddity that is incapable of finding common ground with the rest of human society. There already exists much confusion in the public arena as to what Islam is and what it stands for. And the danger here is that Islam becomes seen as an outcast or the other. Young and frustrated Muslims, incapable of understanding the complexities and richness of the Islamic tradition, seem to be contributing to the vulgarization of Islam in such a way that its richness and humanism are becoming a very distant memory. However, there is hope. It is now becoming apparent that the people of the world are becoming tired of a polarized rhetoric and want different and better alternatives. Relations between the Muslim world and the West will require a joint effort, a process of constructive engagement, dialogue, self-criticism, and change. This presentation tonight does not seek to address Islam and the West as two perennial antagonists, but rather seeks to suggest a new paradigm of Islam in the West. The Holy Quran teaches that God deliberately created a world of diversity. O oh, humankind, we have created you male and female and made you nations and tribes so that you might come to know one another. While Muslims have increasingly become a visible presence in the West, Islam is often viewed as something alien and distant from the people of Britain, when in fact, history tells us otherwise. Contacts within the Islamic world extend back further in time than is generally imagined. Cultural, economic, and diplomatic exchanges initiated great interest in the language of Islam, Arabic. Indeed, by the 17th century, it became an adjunct to a complete university education and was seen to be the hallmark of the enlightened Englishman. At both Oxford and Cambridge universities, students by 1630 had to study Arabic since it was the language in which the books of physics, rhetoric, and astrology were written in. The Cambridge professor in mathematics, Isaac Barra, concurred that mastery of Arabic was necessary for the advancement of learning, while Edward Pocock, the professor of Oxford University, composed poems in Arabic to mock major national occasions, such as was done on the restoration of Charles II in 1660. The relationship between Islam and Britain is a complicated but a rich one. It was one of cultural dialogue and exchange, and one from where trade allowed the transportation of culture and of ideas. Today's times are turbulent and marred by extreme violence, hypocrisy, and moral ambiguity. We live in a time where the two dominant means of wealth are through arms and intoxicants, where first world countries can contravene humanitarian protocols and flout international law, when a nation can refuse to accept the same rules that it demands for all others and face no consequences for doing so, where a nation's consumerist definition of prosperity is killing the planet and it can unilaterally reject the Kyoto Protocol on global, global warming on the ground that reducing greenhouse gas emissions would harm their economy. Peace and prosperity are unlikely to be fostered under such unequal conditions. Islam's message has always been clear. In times of adversity, be patient, and in times of blessings, give thanks. Muslims and non-Muslims alike cannot allow themselves to be defined by the extremists of the other. The Quran, the holy book of the Muslims, does not demand for everyone to be Muslims, but rather 
the Islamic message is that of honoring humanity and bestowing dignity upon the whole of humankind. The Islamic doctrine teaches that the dignity of humanity precedes that of faith. Muslims and non-Muslims cannot afford to hold on to cliches and stereotypes of the other, for as we have seen, the world is far too small to accommodate a clash of ignorance. Tonight's lecture, Sheikh Hamza Yusuf Hansen, was born in Washington State and raised in Northern California. In 1977, he became Muslim and subsequently traveled to the Muslim world and studied for 10 years in the United Arab Emirates, Saudi Arabia, as well as North and West Africa. Upon returning to America, he took degrees in religious studies and health care. He also founded Zaytuna Institute and Academy, which has established an international reputation for presenting a classical picture of Islam in the West. Sheikh Hamza has lectured in universities all over the world, including Yale, Stanford, MIT, and Berkeley in the United States, and Cambridge and Bristol in the UK. He was also the first American lecturer to teach in Morocco's prestigious and oldest university in Fez. Sheikh Hamza has either been interviewed for or has contributed written editorials in The Guardian, The Wall Street Journal, Newsweek, and The Washington Post. He has also appeared on CNN, Al Jazeera, NBC, The BBC, and Channel 4. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Sheikh Hamza Yusuf. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, and prayers and peace upon the Prophet Muhammad and on all of the prophets of God. I, I want to thank all of you for coming tonight, and I hope this will be an interesting evening for you, and I hope it will also perhaps shed some light on some areas that you were unaware of, and perhaps shed more light on areas you may have been aware of, but not to the extent that I hope will become evident as the time goes on. Before we start, uh, I needed to clarify something, or rather clear it up, and that is that unfortunately I share a name with another person in the United Kingdom, and it's not the same name, but it does have uh, part of the same name in it, and this was a recent uh, headline, uh, Hamza calls for suicide bombs in Britain, and I know for some people all Muslims look alike, so unfortunately the picture might not be enough. So I just wanted to point out that this is actually Abu Hamza, which, which means father of Hamza, and I'm not his son, by the way. Uh, and I really am a little upset with the Daily Mail about this, and I'm not going to let them off the hook. So I just wanted to, uh, to make that clear. I want to say that civilization is really the glory of humanity. I mean, this is what, in essence, makes us so extraordinary, so unique. It's also, in many ways, our downfall. We become too civilized, we become too refined, and we fall into what the Catholic Church, who has unfortunately suffered quite a bit in these days, uh, has termed one of the seven deadly sins, Pope Gregory, who, uh, interestingly enough, actually lived at the same time that the Prophet Muhammad did, peace be upon him. He identified seven mortal sins or deadly sins, and anybody who's been around long enough on this planet m must be intimate with at least one of them. And I would like to remind all of you that one is enough to kill you. But the one that... Uh, civilization seems to succumb to the most is luxuria, which is the Latin word for uh, luxury or a type of life of ease, a slothful life, a life in which you forget your purpose. 
Now, civilizations seem to be the strongest when they're in their early periods and they move towards a, a, a maturity, and then they begin their decline and fall. A great British historian that I like quite, quite a lot, Arnold Toynbee, he's fallen out of favor, although his niece, Polly Toynbee, uh, has not with many conservative people on the left side of the spectrum. Uh, Arnold Toynbee said that civilization was rooted in spirituality. He actually felt that every civilization came about because of a spiritual impulse that became so profound that in essence it determined and defined the nature of that civilization that any historian would be looking at at any given time. Now, I do not like the idea of a clash of civilizations because I believe that in essence the idea of a civilization clashing with another civilization is not possible because I think that civilization, if we look at the Latin root of the word, has to do with being polished or refined, being civil. In fact, we like to pride ourselves on civil society. I was once in California with an Arab friend of mine who was visiting from the Middle East, and the light was broken at a four corner, and as the people drove up, they stopped, and they would wait even though the light wasn't working and there was no stoplight, they would wait and then proceed according to each person's turn. Well, this man who was from the Middle East, and I'll veil his country, he said, why are they stopping? And I said, well, because the light's not working and it would be dangerous for them to move in. He said, even in our country, even when the lights work, we don't stop. <laughs> so we do like to pride ourselves on the idea of a civil society. And when that society collapses, and we're seeing that in several places right now around the world, it's actually quite tragic and probably is, is one of the worst things that can happen to a society, the loss of civility, the loss of civility. And I think Bradford, unfortunately, uh, is acutely aware of the danger of losing civility. And so this idea of a clash of civilizations to me is not possible because it's a loss of civility. It's the very opposite of civilization. So I would say it's actually barbarity which is clashing and not civilization. I think that I do not believe in the idea of multiple civilizations with a plural. I actually believe that civilization is one phenomenon. It's one impulse. And I believe from the beginning it's, it's been moving inexorably towards the same ideal, wittingly or unwittingly, whether they knew it or not. I really believe that this, this uh, species that we are all part of, uh, the human being, Homo sapiens, is Homo sapiens, sapiens, the knowing man, the knowing human, is moving towards something which is the highest in us. And that's what civilization represents. And that's why I would say that civilization must always be qualified by an adjective. The adjective, as you know in grammar, is not like the substantive. It's not like the noun. It, it qualifies. So I would say that you have the Islamic civilization, you have the Jewish civilization, you have the African civilization, and, and obviously there would be many different aspects of that, like Egypt, North Africa, Central Africa, you have the South American civilizations there, like the Mayan, the Incan, the Aztec in Mexico. And you have certainly the Cynic, the Hindic civilization. You have the Slavic. And you have the Northern English uh, civilization of Yorkshire. Right? So, and I'm sure you pride yourselves on the many uh, extraordinary aspects of your culture, one of them being the, the, the unique way that you speak the English language. So what I would like to do today is really talk about one great civilization that is called the Islamic civilization. And before I get into that, I want to say that Islamic here is an adjective which defines not simply the Muslims that were working within the ethos of Islam, but in fact describes Chinese people who were Confucianist, Taoist, and other traditions, Buddhist people, some of them who converted to Islam, like the great Afghani people, uh, Hindu people, 
and also the Persian peoples, the Zoroastrian peoples, the Greeks themselves, and the Turkic people, all of these different groups that were working, and certainly the Jewish community, and even the Islamic Christians, which would seem to be somewhat oxymoronic, but I actually believe it describes quite adequately the Christians that were working within the Islamic ethos, writing in Arabic, like uh, Ishaq ibn Hunayn and, and, uh, and several others, who did immense work and helped the Muslims a great deal. So that is what the topic that we're going to be looking at. This verse, which is on a little postcard that you were given by uh, the wonderful ladies that helped to put, put this evening together, and I prefer my translation to theirs without any uh, offense. Uh, the, the word here, Ya Yuhan Nas, O humanity, humankind. Nas is a word that the Quran uses to describe all peoples. And the Quran specifically speaks to different groups, but then when it wants to speak to everybody, it uses this word Nas, meaning humanity. And the root word is the intimate ones, the people of intimacy. I mean, if you look at animals, one of the things that an animal will do in order to pretend that it's dead, it will play possum. It will expose its, its uh, externals, the, 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 uh, the stomach and the abdomen area. Well, this is uh, an area of weakness for animals, obviously, because the organs there can be attacked. And that's why most animals actually are... Uh, giving their front, their chest, and then their back. And they're covering that area and protecting it. Human beings are honored, according to the Quran, because they walk upright. This is one of the reasons why human beings are actually a dignified creature, because we walk upright and we expose our heart to our fellow human beings. And which is interesting, armor, which is the pre modern way in which human beings fought each other was all to protect that area of the body that was exposed. And so we as human beings expose ourselves constantly to each other. I mean, that's what we're really doing. And that is why the, the root word of Nas are the intimate ones, the ones who expose their feelings. They reveal their feelings. How do they do that? They do that in a way that no other creature, as far as we know, can do. And that is through sophisticated language. So we are creatures of language. And then the Quran says, and then we, we create you from a single soul, this androgynous soul, that contained both the male and the female components. And from, according to the Quran, that single soul came the two forms that we call Adam and Eve, Adam wa Hawa, in Arabic and Hebrew, Adam is from the earth, and Eve is a dark, uh, Eve means life, Haya, but it also means dark and tawny, which is also a meaning of Adam, giving an idea that perhaps maybe the first people were dark uh, colored people, and we know that is consistent with genetics, that light skin comes from dark skin, that, that the dominant genes are the, the the brown or the dark eyes and, and the dark skin and the recessive or the white. So the next thing that we're told is that we were made into a plurality of peoples, of nations, uh, of clans, of tribes. And then the Quran says, لِتَعَرَفُ Now as far as I know, this is the only pre-modern example in which the reason for diversity on this planet is actually explained. I don't know any other tradition that explains this. In this way, the Qur'an says the reason that you are so diverse is for ta'aruf. Now, in Arabic, this root means to know each other, to be able to distinguish each other, to be able to benefit from each other's knowledge. Ma'rifa is knowledge. So this idea of benefiting with knowledge from each other, because different peoples have different geniuses. And, and every people have been given this lead of civilization, including the black Africans who had their great time, and there's much evidence for that, the Chinese who had their great time, the, the Hindic people who had their great time, and continue to produce uh, peoples of genius. All these peoples continue to produce peoples of genius. But if we look, there was a time when the dominant 
civilization was with those people. Now, Islam did something very interesting. And that is, and, and I, the reason I wanted to describe also contribution means to flow together for a collective purpose. So tributaries are things that flow off a river. So if you look at the river of civilization, it has many tributaries. But I believe it is one river. Now, in our tradition, we have this myth, and I really believe it is a myth. We have this myth that civilization is the Greeks, and they were extraordinary, and I'm actually a quarter Greek. And my grandfather used to say, do you know who your great-great-great-great-grandfather was? I said, who? He said, Socrates. <laughs> I don't think he had any genealogy to prove that. But his point was to instill pride. And this is part of why it's good to know who you are, from whom you came from, in order to have a sense of your possibility, not to become arrogant, not to feel superior to other people, but actually to see what we did in the past, we can do in the present, and in the future. So there is a, a, a very important aspect in knowing our history, our people's history. So the idea of the Greeks come, the Romans come, and then we have this period called the Dark Ages, and then we have this wonderful period called the Renaissance, and then the Industrial Revolution, which is, is really something that occurs here in England to a large extent, and had a lot of problems, and then modernity, and now we're moving into post-modernity. So the question is, what was going on in this period? Because we've got this upward movement here in the West, I and mean, this is what all our books teach, but then there's this idea that nothing happened. Now, what's beautiful for me about the Islamic civilization is it's like a clearinghouse. If you know that term, it's like a clearinghouse of all of these different civilizations. So you have, for instance, the Chinese are giving to it, the Indian, the Iranian, the Sabian, the Byzantine, the Babylonian, the Greek, the Egyptian. All of them are giving to the Islamic civilization. And I use this, uh, which is Al-Aqsa, it's the Dome of the Rock, because in, when this was built, uh, very early on, only a hundred years after the Prophet Muhammad, this is built, and it's, it's really such a distinctly Islamic architecture. It, and it emerges almost out of nowhere. Uh, it obviously has influences from other architectures, and certainly the Byzantine is there, but it is uniquely its own. And then from there, from the Islamic world, flow uh, to uh, Europe, obviously, and then from Europe to America here. And then I put the rest of the world just to emphasize the idea that that is generally how America and Europe tend to look at everyone else, the rest of the world. In fact, if you don't believe me, just notice when a plane goes down somewhere on the planet, they will say uh, four Americans died, often mentioning the Americans first, uh, two Brits, one Frenchman, and several other nationalities. <laughs> so... What is culture? At the root is a spiritual element, and I think that's certainly true in our Christian culture in the West. Uh, and then you have architecture, you have uh, the beautification of life, you have knowledge, you have science, you have medicine, you have transportation, you have certainly food, which is very important, and then you have entertainment. These are all aspects of culture. Now, if you get to the most important thing that human beings do every day as a daily in order to maintain their bodies, not their souls, but their bodies, we drink. And now, around the world, probably the three most common drinks are tea, soda, and coffee. Now, tea is from China, and the Chinese introduce it to the uh, Arab merchants. It moves down into India, and it begins to spread throughout the Muslim world and then begins to move up into Spain. And that's why to this day in Morocco, in North Africa, they drink Chinese green tea and call it gunpowder, baroud. Now, the second is soda, which is from an Arabic word. Soda is an Arabic word. Bicarbonate is from sawada, and this was actually something that the Arab chemists developed. So bicarbonated water is actually an Islamic uh, Muslim invention. Now, coffee is an Arabic word, qahwa. Uh, qahwa is uh, wine in Arabic. It's a type of wine. And the reason they call it qahwa, because the early Muslims, like the Mormons of today, were very worried about coffee. And they, they actually thought that 
it, it created a type of, uh, uh, of uh, intoxication not dissimilar to wine. And so several of them actually said it's prohibited. And what happened, there was a long debate, and I've read it's very humorous, and what I'm convinced happened is they needed to try it before they uh, made their uh, legal judgments about it, and I think they just got to like it so much that they decided, well, yeah, no, it's, it's halal. So the Muslims uh, drink coffee today. Now, the Turkish coffee house uh, shows up around 1545. It's very interesting. And it was a place where people would get together and talk. And uh, this is, to, to this day, coffee is called coffee arabica. It was discovered in Yemen. Some claim that it was discovered by a shepherd in Ethiopia, Kaldi, and you will often find different peoples vying to the Germans claim they discovered calculus and the English claim they discovered calculus. But uh, no doubt Yemen, uh, which mocha is a town in Yemen, so when you get your mocha coffee, uh, you're actually getting a coffee that's attributed to a town. The, the Yemeni, Abul uh, Hassan al-Shadiri, um, who was a Sufi, and he needed, he kept falling asleep at night. He liked to do night prayers. And he claims to have had a dream in which an angel came and showed him the coffee plant and explained how he, because you have to wonder how they actually thought of roasting it and chopping it and then boiling it. It's very interesting, but a lot of things are like that. So dreams are one of the means by which people learn things. The, he, and this is why today it's called Shadaliya in Syria coffee. Now, the other story is that uh, a Yemeni shepherd was watching goats eat these beans, and he would notice that they were a little lethargic when they started eating them, and by the end of it, they were bouncing about and felt great, so he thought he'd uh, see what the secret was. Now, food, spice, we know this is uh, the stuff of legend in the West. The Crusaders in 1099, when they went to the East, they discovered for the first time food that actually tasted like something. And uh, this actually begins uh, uh, the beginning of European conquest. I mean, in fact, the Europeans were actually looking for ways simply to make their food taste better. I mean, let's face it. And really what Columbus was after was not gold, but simply spices. And that's why they call that area that he discovered to this day the Spice Islands. Well, all of these spices that came from the Muslim world, cinnamon, black pepper, cardamom, saffron, zafaran, curry and ginger, which is actually from Arabic as well, zanjabil, and many others. Now, people would never associate with Muslims sweets. In fact, unfortunately today, a lot of people associate bitterness with Muslims. But it is, in fact, the Muslims that gave the West sweets. So, and it gets even stranger, because the word candy, if you look it up in Chambers' Etymological Dictionary, is from a word that means uh, crystallized sugar, kandi in Arabic, kandi. I mean, it's an Arabic word. You can look it up in any etymological dictionary. So candy, I mean, who would have thought that candy was... Now, sugar is also an Arabic word. And again, the Hindus claim it as their own, saying that... And there is some evidence, because sakarin was used also by the Latins. But sukkar in Arabic is the word that's used, and that is how it came to the West. Sugar came through Arabic, not through... Uh, Sanskrit. And sukkar comes from a root word which means to ferment and to intoxicate. And obviously sugar is an important element in uh, the uh, process of uh, making alcohol. So the next thing is ice cream cone. Who would ever thought that the ice cream cone was a Muslim invention? But if you look uh, in the history of the ice cream cone, although there are two claimants, the Italians, and I'll get back to that a little later, the Italians and the Syrians. Now, the Syrian person that claims it, his name was Anas Hamawi from Hama, and, or what they called, uh, it's, it's now Hama in, in Arabic. He uh, was at the 1904 World, World's Fair in St. Louis, and next door they were, there was an ice cream stand, and I'll get to ice cream in a second, where that came from. And uh, the ice cream was beginning to melt. The man ran out of plates, and he couldn't sell it. So Anas Hamawi was making a... Uh, Syrian dish called zalabiya, which is a, it's a sweet uh, bread that uh, has syrup in it. 
And so he said, here, just put it in these. And so he started wrapping them, and he would give this to this ice cream seller, and that was the birth of the ice cream cone. Now, where does ice cream come from? Ice cream is usually associated with Italy. Well, lo and behold, the Italians had immense trade and commerce with the Turks, the Ottomans. And the Ottomans actually developed what was called sh- uh, shorbe, or sh- sh- in, in Arabic, sherbet is an Arabic name. It's not French, sorbe. It's actually Arabic. It's come from a root word, sharab, which means a drink. Uh, shorbat was a Turkish sweet drink with ice, uh, what they call, I think, gelatino now in Italy or something, a gelato. Now, this, some claim the Muslims actually learned this from the Chinese, and I think that point is debatable, but there's no doubt that it was the Muslims that introduced ice cream into. And I wouldn't take too much. I mean, I don't think these are great contributions to. They probably been great contributions to dentist associations uh, more than anything. But uh, they are nonetheless things that sweeten our, our lives, and we certainly use them uh, to do so. Now, fruits, the pomegranate is actually palm de granat, which is granada. Uh, it's an Indian fruit that was introduced into Arabia many, many centuries ago, and the Arabs brought it into Spain. Now, it is known that the Greeks did know of, of many of these fruits, like cherries and other fruits, but it was actually through the Muslims, traders, that the plants were brought into Europe, largely through Spain. Banana is an Arabic word. Banan means fingers. And this was also uh, from India, and it moves into West Africa and comes up to Europe. It was a very useful fruit because it can be transported uh, green and ripen over a period of time. Carez or cherries. The Greeks knew of cherries, but again, it came to us through Spain. Lemon is a Chinese. It's a southern Chinese. Limon, it's actually a Chinese word. And then the Arabs, uh, through the Persians, adopted it. Now, who would have thought that orange uh, is one of these contributions? Or, orange is from naranj, which is a Sanskrit word to describe that fruit. And the Arabs called it naranja, which becomes naranja in Spanish and orange in, uh, in the uh, English. So orange marmalade, marmalade, by the way, is actually uh, jam, jama, which means collected or gelled, is a uh, a Syrian and also a Turkish uh, way of uh, preserving these fruits. And so orange marmalade, I mean, who would think that orange marmalade it was a Muslim contribution to Great Britain? I mean, it's just really unusual. So when you're drinking your coffee in the morning and putting orange marmalade on your wheat bread, remember who to be thankful to, God. <laughs> Now, dates, wherever Muslims went, dates went. Aubergine is actually from uh, Bavinjan, which is a Persian word, eggplant. Uh, Artichoke, harashif, is also an Arabic word. Spinach is from an Arabic word. These were all introduced. Now, the potatoes. See, I want to also dispel another myth because I like to defend other civilizations as well. So I put this in here to remind you of another malign civilization that very few people recognize their great contributions, and that's the Irish. So this is actually has nothing to do with Islam, but a little pitch for the Irish people. (laughs) The potato is the least of their contributions, all right? And I would suggest you read Thomas Cahill, How the Irish Saved Civilization, because I think many British people will be absolutely shocked at what the Irish did uh, to really preserve knowledge in Europe. And a lot of people do not give them credit, so I'd just like a little hand for the Irish. Many of the legumes that we uh, consume actually came through the Muslims, were introduced into Europe. Wheat bread, although the Romans, uh, barley bread was the dominant, and oat bread here in in the British Isles. And although the Romans did know about wheat and did uh, introduce wheat, again, it was Arabs in Spain that brought wheat uh, up into uh, France and then England and these other places. And what's interesting to me is everybody thinks Marco Polo invented spaghetti or brought it from China. But the truth is, before Marco Polo, by 200 years, spaghetti is described as a Sicilian Muslim dish. And this is absolutely confirmed. You can look it up. Uh, 
So it was actually the, the North African Muslims that developed very thin strips of semolina that they ate. And to this day, if you've ever eaten in an Arab restaurant, you will notice little thin spaghetti-like strips in the rice. And this was actually the origin of spaghetti. There was an immense influence. Uh, the Muslims were in uh, for th about 300 years. They lived in Sicily and southern Spain and have an immense influence on the... Uh... Now, again, who would have thought that Cat Stevens would become an Islamic contribution to Europe? But he is. So he's now used of Islam. But the reason I put him in there is I love this picture here because you can see the Christian, he's looking at this moor, doing some riff, and he's saying, whoa, whoa, slow down. Show me, show me that again. You see, he's obviously taking lessons. And I'm not joking. The, the troubadour is from tarab, which is an Arabic word. The mutrib, the troubadour, is the one that delights you with his music. And, and love songs come directly out of the Arab-Hispanic tradition uh, of southern Europe. And this spreads all over Europe into England. And you find the lute, which is an Arabic word, oud. And you find the guitarra morisco, which is the, the Muslim guitar. It's a North African invention. And it was brought to Spain by an extraordinary musician known as Ziryad who not only introduced several innovations into music in general, but he is most noted for the idea of a movement. And if anybody of you have studied music, you will know that there are musical compositions that involve movements. Well, movement is a direct translation from an Arabic word, noba. And it was Ziryab, this extraordinary Persian musician, who fled the court of uh, Harun al-Rashid in about 852 Cordoba, and he introduces this idea. He also introduces many, many instruments. One of them, he was the one that added the sixth string onto the, uh, the fifth string onto the oud. It was originally a four-stringed instrument. And later they add a sixth string. He also, fret is from uh, the farda. It's an Arabic word, fret. I mean, if you look in these dictionaries, you'll, a lot of these words, they'll say origin unknown. But I, I mean, this is absolutely true. There are many, many examples of, of the influences that Islam had. Tambourine is from tambour. It's a, it's a Persian Arabic word. Kanun, if you ever see a kanun, which is invented by an extraordinary musician known as Al-Farabi, among other things. I mean, that's only one thing that he did. He spoke 73 languages. He was an absolute philosophical genius. But one of the things he did was he was a musician. He invented the kanun, which is plucked. If you look at a piano, the prototype of the piano is actually from two kanuns put together, and then the percussion element was added by Europeans. So this, this is originally a, a, a Muslim invented the, 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 the instrument, but it was developed by Europeans, and this is one of our most important instruments for the composition, both the guitar and the piano. And I just put this in there. I don't particularly like Jimi Hendrix. I mean, and I know that's sacrilege for some people, but uh, I just liked when I saw this picture of this uh, Spanish Muslim plucking his oud, it reminded me of that picture um, of Jimi Hendrix, who died in England, for those of you who remember. Now, Muslim is from Mosul, which is a little town, it's a rather mid-sized town in Iraq. And originally, these fine textiles were developed in Bangladesh. And one of the terrible things that the British did while they were there, and I don't hold the northern British to account for that, but rather the southern British, uh, one of the things that they did was they cut off Bangladeshi textile manufacturers' fingers uh, because they were competing with the textile looms of, Brad of Manchester and Birmingham. So... Uh, there's a lot of tragic history there. But there was a time, believe it or not, when Bangladesh was probably the most civilized country on the planet. And I'm not exaggerating. And so I just want you all to remember that, that what goes around comes around. What goes up must come down. And that applies for all of us. And it's only a matter of time. So, Now, silk is an extraordinary Chinese invention, but it is the Muslims that introduce it. Cotton is an Arabic word, qutan. I mean, I'm not making that up. Arabic word. 
clothing, pajama, pajama. If you look pajama, if you look in Chambers Dictionary of Etymology, it says pajama means in Persian loose fitting on the legs. And, and Chambers says a loose fitting garment that Muslims wear and Europeans adopted for nightwear. And this is why Muslims always feel very uncomfortable in Western clothes, right? And some of them still refuse to take off their pajamas. So that's why you see so many Asian people in England walking around in pajamas because they're, they're, they think Europeans are crazy. I mean, why, why are you only comfortable at night? <laughs> so the, the chamis is qamisa. It's the shirt in, in Arabic. Qamis means shirt. Chemis, that's where it comes from. And then the kufi is becoming more and more popular. All of these extraordinary motifs are Persian, Chinese, uh, and also Turkish. And they all move in and influence European dress. You will see major changes after the Crusades in the dress of Europeans. And a lot of the architecture also changes. Now, another aspect, leather. I mean, believe it or not, the tanning of leather is largely a North African phenomenon. And they taught both the Italians. I mean, isn't it interesting that our finest leather comes from Italy and comes from Spain? And this is direct influence. I'm, I'm, so when you wear comfortable shoes, do you know, I mean, think about where that came from. It came from tanning techniques of Berbers and Arabs that taught them to the uh, Spanish and the Italians. Furniture, the mattress, again, Chambers Etymological Dictionary, and you can look this up in Oxford or Webster. Ch- mattress comes from matrah, which is what Arabs, uh, the word the Arabs use to uh, describe a bed. So mattress, I mean, isn't that interesting, mattress? I mean, the Europeans introduced spring mattress. So. Now, sofa is also sufa, and isn't it interesting that we call divan and ottomans? We have these words that are coming because... When Europeans went and saw, they'd never thought of putting a cushion on a chair. They just used to sit on wood. And they thought, you know, that's a brilliant idea. <laughs> you know, why didn't we think of that before? You know, but this is, this is what it is. It's learning from each other. It's contribution, right? So, I mean, people are much more comfortable. You're all sitting in these nice sofa chairs. Sofa is an Arabic word. Architecture is another. I mean, hadith wa haraj. The this is called balcony, origin unknown. In Persian, it's called balakhana. That's the word to describe this architecture, balakhana. Now, I love this picture because this is a parade in Turkey showing the glass uh, manufacturers. So they're parading through the town on a float. Look at it. I mean, where did we didn't even think of these things? Floats. This is, in, this is the you know, 15th century. Now, I like this because nowadays Muslims have these stupid parades with all their weapons that they bought from Britain and America, not that they produced here. They're, you know, so now they're boasting their weapons of mass destruction that nobody seemed to have found. But here they used to boast their weapons of glass production. <laughs> so I really, I really enjoy that uh, slide there. Crystal is a Spanish invention from the Muslims of Spain. Crystal, who would think? Crystal. I mean, we enjoy this. Ziryab, the the musician, also introduced the idea of having multi-course meals. I mean, isn't that extraordinary? That was actually introduced by a Iraqi Muslim in Cordoba to the Muslims of Cordoba at the court, the idea of having, they usually just put all their food at one time. And he said, no, 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 it's very uncivilized. You should do it. And people have better appetite and things like that. So also they introduced crystal. Now the Europeans used to drink from wood and, and the rich people drank from metal, like gold. If they were really rich, they drank from gold and silver goblets. It was the Muslims that introduced the refined, because Muslims are not allowed to drink from gold or silver. It's actually prohibited in Islamic law because of the idea of luxury and the danger of uh, the class separation getting so great. You know, people that are very poor and people that are very rich are living such different lives. So they introduced the idea of glass. So the wealthy people used to drink from glass. Believe it or not, stained glass is actually a Syrian technique, and I'm not exaggerating. Muslims will often think that when they put stained glass on mosques, they're imitating Christians. It's actually the opposite. 
It was the Christian churches that learned this technique from the Muslims, and I'm not exaggerating. In fact, there was a treaty between the Egyptians and the Italians in which part of the treaty was the Egyptians would teach the Italians how to make fine glass and how to make colored glass. And in that treaty, uh, because the Muslims really didn't have a problem teaching people how to make glass, but they did teach them how to make this glass. And there was an island called Moreno, which is still a major source of glass uh, in Italy. This was an island that the, the Italian glassmakers were literally imprisoned on this island because they did not want to get this uh, out to other European countries. And so the Italians for over a hundred years, had a monopoly on glass production in Europe. And one of, when they brought glass back from the Muslim world during the Crusades, they were often put in churches as relics, and they would take them out on holy days because they thought that they were miracles of saints. They couldn't believe that people actually could make things like that. I mean, it's very difficult for us to conceive of these things, but there was a time when glass was miraculous. And here we are, just right there, all that glass. And you should have water too, but unfortunately the Alhambra uh, Theater would not allow us to serve water in there. So we apologize, and I'm sorry to say that, but I just want to say Muslims are generally uh, pride themselves on their generosity, and that's only because I think they had some fire hazards with water or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> now, who would have thought skyscrapers is a Yemeni invention? right? Now, I heard that these two Yemenis were sitting around talking and, and they devised a plan to rebuild Yemen. Um, they said, let's go blow up something in America and, uh, and then they'll come and rebuild our country. And, uh, and the one Yemeni said to the other, you haven't thought this thing out enough. And he said, why? And he said, what if we win? <laughs> Some of my best friends are Yemenis, by the way. So. Now, who would have thought? You see, the English garden, and again, not an exaggeration, English people pride themselves on gardens, and they're distressed to no end when Muslims move in next door and concrete their gardens. <laughs> so, <laughs> and I really, I'm disgusted, and I want to tell all these people here who are Muslim, get up one of those things, and when, you're most, when your neighbors are at work, so they're not disturbed by it, and, you know, those jackhammers, and get rid of that concrete, let that grass come back, you know. But take care of it, because British people like to see things orderly. That's why the queen, she's always, I mean, it's nice to see her. Everything's just perfectly in place. Now, Alhambra Palace was this extraordinary garden. There were gardens all over Spain. And where does that flowing river come from? It comes from a description in the Quran of paradise. The paradise are gardens through which rivers flow. And so whenever you go to these beautiful parks in England and look at that water flowing and these beautiful gardens, really, I mean, I'm not making this up. This is really the source of where it comes from. And after Muslim Spain was conquered, gardens show up all over and gardens are ancient. I mean, the, 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 per, the Muslims actually got it from Persians. In fact, the word paradise is a Persian word, ferdaus. And the Persians say perdaus. And paradise, which means garden in Persian, is, is the word we use for paradise. So isn't it interesting that the Quran described the, the afterworld as a jannah, a garden, and we too in English say paradise, which is a Persian word to mean garden. So we both share a similar concept of the best of the afterlife. Now, they, this spreads all over Europe, these beautiful gardens, and windmills. See, people think windmills are from Holland. Well, remember your Don Quixote. Don Quixote uh, was going around chasing windmills, and this is the 1570s uh, and 80s, 1550s. I mean, it's very interesting. No, actually because both Shakespeare and they were born on the same day or died on the same day. One of the, I think they died on the same day. Um, so this was late 16th century. He's got him going around chasing windmills. Windmills were a Persian invention, and they were introduced uh, to the Arabs, and the Arabs brought them to Spain, and they spread throughout, and this is the, throughout Europe, and this is the beginning of technology, really. Now, the Arabian horse, and, and the queen better than anybody knows 
that the best of her horses come from the Arabian Peninsula. It's the longest uh, known lineage. And the Arabs actually know the, the ancestry of their horses. They can take horses back to the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, still to this day. I mean, there are horses that they know that Abu Bakr rode this horse's ancestor. And it's not an exaggeration, which is very unusual. But Arab blood is the chief and dominant source of the thoroughbred and has restored the most desirable qualities to countless breeds. Now, I, I just want to point out that, that thoroughbreds are high strung. They're considered the most intelligent of the horses, but Arab horses are high strung. And if you don't treat them nicely, they tend to get, they buck about and cause problems. So that's just a little tip about Arabian horses and how to treat them. Uh, where you take that tip uh, is, is your own Mathematics. Now, we say logarithm, and that's actually Al-Khawarizmi, who was an extraordinary scholar. In 850, Christian era, he introduced zero. Although it's an Indian Hindu uh, concept, zero is an Arabic word that comes from sifru. Sifru means zero. And that is the concept that he introduced and... He also is noted to have invented algebra, although the Greeks did have something similar. Algebra is an Arabic word meaning to mend broken parts, the idea of equalizing equations, making them equal equations. He invented the algorithm. He also developed the decimal system, which has benefited us to no end. And I want to point out these are not Indian numerals. These are actually Arabic numerals. Indian numerals are what the Arabs use today, except for North Africa, because the North Africans maintained the original Arabic numerals, and they introduced them to Spain. And there was a very interesting character uh, in the, in the mid-9th uh, century, who, his name was Gerbert. And he was a Spanish student who goes down, he learns about these numerals, he goes down to southern Spain and studies with the Arabs, learned Arabic, mastered many of the sciences, but particularly mathematics, wrote the first treatise on mathematics uh, using these numerals, and he goes on to become Pope Sylvester II. I mean, this is history. This is what's, what, what's happened. Now, if you look, why do they use these numbers? Because they indicate the number of angles. So here's one angle, two angles, three, and I hope you can work out what the other ones are. If you can't, you need remedial work in mathematics. Uh, and also this uh, plane geometry, which, which was the geometry of the Greeks, the Muslims introduced this idea of this uh, spherical and three-dimensional geometry that becomes very sophisticated. And, I mean, although the Greeks did have formulas in which they could do some pretty extraordinary things, uh, the Muslims developed this to such a degree that trigonometry uh, comes largely out of the study of Arabic and Persian astronomy, and then, interestingly enough, uh, attempting to determine the great circle route to Mecca. So the Muslims, long before Columbus, were aware of the... Uh, the, the, the uh, circular nature of the, the earth and actually determined, uh, like the Greeks before them, very specifically how to work out points on, on the planet. And we have some very sophisticated analog computers that were invented by Muslims in order to determine uh, the direction to Mecca. Now, robotics. I am not exaggerating. This is a book, and I have this book in my library. It was written in the 8th century by an engineer from Iraq of all places. And this was a robot that he invented. He had a hydraulic system, and uh, he could do several things for him. Um, he shows how to put it together and using the arm. I mean, look at this. It's really interesting stuff. He tells you how to put it together here. And, and uh, this was, he used this one, could dust. So, and it, it also could offer drinks and things like this. And, I mean, he shows you the hydraulics in there. A lot of it was use, using water hydraulics. This is another one. See, so he's got his little hammer, right? And th this is a robot here, and it's a robotic uh, animal, too. And, and they use these sophisticated hydraulics to create uh, motions that were continuous enough, would last long enough to produce energy sources uh, for these machines. This was a cuckoo clock. So, I mean, lo and behold... 
Who would have thought? Now, I want to stop here and point out that the Muslims actually invented clocks, which is a bit ironic given the fact that they uh, seem to be the most, you know, late people on this planet. And, and I just want to say there's a reason for that. And I'm going to explain this. This is probably the first time in British history where you actually find out why South Asians are always late. With, with all apologies to my South Asian friends. In Urdu, the word for yesterday and tomorrow is the same. <laughs> it's, it's kal, kal. <laughs> que amo si uh, You see, what, what, what South Asians were doing was they were giving themselves about 72 hours to get things done. So if they said, I'll do it, Cal, you know, <laughs> just giving little time. So there you have it. I mean, that's the real reason. But they did invent clocks, and the Quran is very, uh, I mean, this is really interesting. This was a robotic band that uh, he invented, and they played instruments, and here's the hydraulics. You had to fill it up. They would go down and cause this, or somebody could do this from here. Right? And this played, they actually played, he had a flute player, so there was air, and he had a string player and a drum player. And then this one, he had robots that would serve different colored drinks, and that's how he described it. So you could go, you could push a button, and you would get like uh, the, the, the shorbet, or you'd get water, or you'd get the tea, or whatever. Now, according to Imam al-Qarafi in the ninth century, he claims, and I've, I've seen this, and I, and I have no reason to disbelieve him because he was an extraordinary upright person known for this. He claims to have invented a robot that he could get to do everything except talk. And he said he was working on that. But he, he couldn't get it to talk. Now, medicine is another area. And, I, and I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm running out of time. But medicine is another extraordinary area uh, of, of, of Muslim contribution. Avicenna was taught until... Uh, the, I think, 17th century, his book was still a dominant textbook in the medical colleges of Europe. And then uh, there, there was kind of a move against his textbook. There were several different schools of medicine in the Muslim world. Um, hospitals, again, the Greeks had hospitals, but they were not in any way what we would call today hospitals. They were actually temples of sleep. And they were places, it was mostly superstitious, they would go there and people would sleep. And there was a lot of incantations and, and, and things like that. Although the Greeks, Hippocrates was quite sophisticated, that type of medicine was not widespread. On the other hand, we know for a fact that the first hospital, and this is in medical history in the West, Sartan, who wrote the history of science, and many other Western scholars have admitted this. The first hospital in the history of human civilization was in, uh, created, built in Iraq. Something really to think about. Built, built in Iraq. And it was built with the intent of healing people. And one of the conditions that was written in the endowment statement was that, that no... <laughs> Excuse me. Was that no one would be turned away for free care because of religion? The man who designed the hospital took a recently slaughtered lamb and had the meat placed in different points in the city, and then he went to see which one was least decayed after three days. And he felt that the air was best in that area, and it was a better area. So this was a scientific experiment. Uh, and there was also a pharmacy. There were nurses. I mean, this, this is all uh, the history. Um, 
pharmacies is another extraordinary area. The Muslims actually distinguished between uh, drugs that used one compound and drugs that used uh, multiple compounds, or one, rather, substance and then compound drugs. Anatomy, this is an early Muslim anatomy textbook, uh, and that's already 4th century. This is a, another uh, Muslim uh, Central Asian textbook showing the nervous system and the blood, uh, the blood system here. Um, the eye, we know that Ibn Muqla uh, developed the camera obscura, studied the eye, wrote a treatise on the illnesses of the eye. We know that Muslims were doing cataract surgeries, very clearly described in the books. Um, this is animal uh, veterinarianism was very important. Husbandry was one of the major, like today, obviously. And so they were very concerned about the health of animals as well. Astronomy, one of the most extraordinary aspects of Islamic science was astronomy. The astrolabe, which was originally developed by the Greeks, uh, the Muslims had over 300 functions that an astrolabe could do. And the compass, although the compass is a 12th century Chinese invention. The Chinese never used it for navigation. The first people to use it for navigation were the Arab sailors. And the Chinese used it for divination. And I, unfortunately, there was a, a, was a book written on the compass not that long ago by, I think, Havlev. Um, and I, it was just erroneous. I mean, the, the, we, there are many, many uh, examples. And there's been wonderful work done in Germany by Dr. David King and his students. He's originally from Great Britain, uh, who's been studying Islamic science for a long, long time, and they have exceptional work. And there's no doubt that it was the Arab sailors that introduced the compass into navigation. And um, also the globes that become so popular in, in Europe were uh, another invention here of the Muslims. I want to point out that this is the Big Dipper, and every single star today in the books of astronomy has an Arabic name. Out of the 3,000 visible stars in, in the sky today, most of the more advanced uh, star books that give the nomenclature of the stars will give the Arabic name. Out of the 54 navigational stars that every pilot has to learn and sailors learn, 43 of them still retain their Arabic names to this day. So this was an extraordinary area of uh, Islamic uh, science. And the Muslims actually, the book, because Ptolemy did not, he did not master all of the stars. He was, he, 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 uh, the stars were catalog, cataloged by Persian astronomers. And then uh, Ibn Sufi was a great astronomer. His book was translated into Latin. And like today, the Arabs take many scientific names from English. Like the Arabs call oxygen, oxygen. And that's what they do, oxygen. They don't think of, they say, well, they discovered it, so that's the name it gets. Telephone is tirifun. So that's what they did. Now, this actually was uh, an, uh, Turkish here. This was an uh, astronomy uh, an observatory here, and they're all studying. And that, this is 16th century, and there's a globe of the Earth, and you can see Africa in that globe. So it's very sophisticated because cartography was part of this. Now this here, astronomy students, there you have them studying astronomy there. And here's an astronomer taking measurements. This was the great observatory of, uh, of uh, Uluq Beg, who unfortunately was assassinated by terrorists, Muslim extremists. He was a brilliant Muslim ruler, uh, patron of the arts, and uh, it was the Hashashin uh, who were, where we get our word, unfortunately, assassin uh, from, which they were uh, a terrible group of terrorists um, that really caused a lot of grief. And interestingly enough, it was the Mongols that finally eliminated them. Uh, and then this is a modern observatory, but it's very beautiful. That And then here's globes and sundials. Uh, navigation, again, the astrolabe was used and very sophisticated tools of that time, the compass. And then graph paper is a 4th century Islamic invention. It doesn't show up until the 16th century in Europe. Very interesting. This is the famous first world map of Al-Idrisi, 
And you can see here, there's the Arabian Peninsula right there. And, uh, and then here, over here. He's, he's actually put the south on the top. Um, and then you have Europe uh, over here. So, I mean, it's, it's a good start. Given that they were, and then this is obviously another most early Muslim map, the Piri Rais map that shows uh, Antarctica, which is very interesting because here you have the university chair, and we get into academia. Why do we call a person the chair of this or the chair of that? It doesn't make any sense at all if you think about it. Well, it makes sense when you realize that in the Islamic university tradition, the only person that got to sit on a chair was the teacher. And that's why to this day in Muslim universities that it was called Kursiun Nahu, the chair of grammar, the chair of mathematics. And this is literally where it comes from and this has been proven again by George Mukdasi, uh, a Christian professor at Temple University who wrote an extraordinary book called The Rise of Colleges proving that the institution of the college uh, he believes, and there is some debate, but he believes was adopted by the crusaders and brought back by the hospitalers uh, who uh, build the first uh, college in France, and then it spreads throughout Europe. The academic gown, this was called Jubbat al-Faqih, and then the tassel, which we call a sash uh, that falls off. That's from shash in Arabic. So that tassel was from uh, the Muslims. And when a Muslim graduated from a, a traditional college in the Muslim world, he was given the tassel. And he was told that there's a verse in the Quran that said, God has your forelock in his hand and can seize you any time. And he was told to use that as a reminder that they should never lie, they should never give opinions that aren't correct and what they truly believe. So this was the idea of academic integrity as opposed to scholars for dollars. Now, the diploma here is... Is, and this is pretty much what it is today, you know, just put your university of choice on there. I mean, you can buy these things nowadays. Um, it all started by selling those House of Lords, you know, the peerages. I mean, <laughs> once you start doing that, it just all goes downhill from there. So, so this, this is called the Ijaza, which was the license to teach, which is a direct translation of a Latin... Uh, the Latin is a direct translation from the Arabic, which was used in medieval Europe, uh, and then, or rather, scholastic Europe, which is... And then, that license to teach is what we now call the doctorate, which is a person is, has the ijaza to teach. And they used to have these stamps that they would put on and the names of the teachers that gave them permission. Education of women. The, the Muslims early on, and unfortunately, this is one of the tragedies of later Islam, in the early period, the Muslims, uh, the women would learn with the men in the same institutions and uh, several great, in fact, in the tabaqat literature, which is the biographical literature of uh, Muslim scholars, around 15% of the notable scholars of the Muslim generations before the 14th generation were women. And we have many, many great uh, female scholars that are, were noted for their uh, erudition, for their knowledge, for their poetry, literature. And one of the interesting things in the entire history of Islam, many of the women became what are known as muhaddithun, people that transmit the traditions of the Prophet Muhammad. And we have many women in the chains to this day. And Aisha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, she is the most famous. But... In the history of Islam, there is no woman ever recorded to have fabricated a hadith about the Prophet Muhammad, where there are literally thousands of men that uh, did that. Um, so that is one of the things that early on Muslim scholars noted about the honesty and integrity of, of female scholarship. Now, libraries, again, libraries, there were ancient libraries, and the, and the Library of Alexandria is one of the great ones. Uh, the Muslims did not burn that. That was not burnt long before the Muslims ever came onto the scene. But the largest library that we know of was in, in Cairo, and it had 7 million books. I mean, historically, we have a library in Cairo that had 7 million books. If you look at this is pre 
publication. Today, the Library of Congress has 25 million books. So there's the Library of Congress, and most of them are, as they say in England, rubbish. So... Uh, literature, the impact of literature in, in the West is extraordinary. Charles Dickens said that one of his great influences was the Arabian Nights. The same is true for uh, Stevenson, uh, Louis Stevenson. And, uh, in fact, the Christmas Carol is, is a, a motif that's found in the Arabian Nights. So I'll also mention Daniel Defoe, who wrote uh, Robinson Crusoe, was a... Muslim, uh, he was a captive in Muslim Algeria. His, his ship was captured by Muslim sailors, and he was taken and impressed in Algeria for some time. And it's known that Robinson Crusoe is taken from a famous uh, Spanish uh, novel that was written by uh, Ibn Bajja, uh, who, and it was called Hayy ibn Yaqdan, which is uh, a famous treatise about a man who lives on an island and discovers the truth. Uh, by himself. So, and also Cervantes spent seven years in a, uh, a Spanish, uh, I mean he was a prisoner technically, but he actually lived in the palace and was an advisor to the, uh, to the Algerian um, ruler. I mean people forget that many Europeans in order to be upwardly mobile would actually go to the Muslim world and become what were known as renegades. And I'll give you one example of a, of a renegade. Renegado they called him. Uh, Peter Lyle was a Scottish man who was um, captured um, by the Americans, impressed into the American Navy, hated the Americans after the experience, ends up uh, uh, in Tripoli, and he was such a skilled person, very clever. He soon rises in the ranks, and he actually becomes an admiral in the Ottoman Navy, and he took the name Murad Rais, uh, Peter Lyle. And Murad Rais convinced the, the, the Bay of Tripoli to wage war on the Americans. Big mistake at that time. And, uh, but I could just imagine him saying, you know, we've got to drive these Americans out of the <laughs> Mediterranean. Right? And I would like to see that on a film because that would be quite interesting, you know, to have uh, this Scottish, Turkish admiral, you know, confronting the Americans. I mean, where the hell did he come from? <laughs> Because there's so many stereotypes about Americans, I mean about uh, Muslims, and there were tens of thousands of European Muslims. Now, if you look at language, admiral is Amir al-Bahr. That's where it comes from. And alcohol is al-Qahul, elixir, elixir, jar is jarra. Uh, mohair is mukhayr. It's a very fine, mukhayr means the best. Racket is raha, I mean, there's some debate about that. Bay about that, root, spinach, isfanach, talk is talk, uh, zarqon, and many other words. In fact, uh, one of the interesting things about words, people don't, there's a lot of words in the dictionaries nobody knows where they came from, like bug is a word. You, if you look it up, it'll say origin unknown. Anybody who's ever been to the Arab world knows that bug is what Arabs call insects, right? Bug, it's, a, it's from baq. And baq is pronounced in Yemen and, and several other Arab countries as bug. And, and pest is a bug. I mean, if you're bug, somebody's bugging you, um, that, that's where that comes from. So paper in 792, uh, Muslims capture in a battle in Central Asia, Chinese. They take them to Baghdad and they teach them how to make paper. The first paper uh, factory, which was state-operated and actually dispensed paper to all the teaching institutions to facilitate the spread of knowledge. And it's well known that, unfortunately, the Turks actually refused uh, to introduce the printing press into Turkey uh, early on, even though block printing was taken from the Chinese uh, and, and comes to Europe. They, they refused it because they did not want to destroy the, the, the lobbyists the, that were from the scri uh, scriveners, the scrivener lobby, the people that wrote uh, texts, were so powerful and they were worried that it was going to destroy their industry. So they were like Luddites, if people know about the Luddites, Ned Ludd and the people that opposed it. So that's where uh, paper came from China, and then it's introduced later on into Europe. Chess, shataranj, is a shataranj, means four divisions, and this was, it's a Sanskrit word. It c comes into Arabia. Now, interesting thing about Arabic chess, the weakest piece was the queen. 
And it was the French, right, because French women, they were the ones that let her loose. I mean, they really gave her a lot of power there. So, and irrespective of that power, Marie Antoinette still ended up on the guillotine. So. Now, and ruch is from a Persian word, ruch, and the pawn, the, the berak in Arabic is the same meaning, peon, you know, the lowest one. But isn't it interesting in that game, the pawn can become a, a, a queen. And isn't that interesting? You know, through sacrifice and through endeavor, so, which is meritocracy. I mean, it's the idea that, you know, that you can, your status can, if you get to the other side and win, your status can change. So it's actually quite an extraordinary game. Um, backgammon, there's Prince Charles playing polo. Muslims play polo, but uh, they learned it from these Central Asians who used to take the head of the ruler uh, that they defeated and knock it around. So, And you can see Prince Charles knocking around the, the Argentinian president there uh, after the Falkland Islands, right? I mean, thank God we've moved along, or have we? <laughs> So here's the Ottoman band. The, the, the military band is a Turkish invention. Even though the, there, there are ancient, the Greeks, you know, and they used to have war drums. I mean, they're very ancient war drums. But the actual idea of having a band is, is from the Ottoman Turks. And they used to march with these massive sound. And the way the Ottomans would march, it's very interesting. They would, they would do one, two, and then turn to the side like this. And, and one, two, and then turn to the side like that. And their point was to slow down their march to give the people time to actually surrender because they didn't like to fight if they didn't have to. They preferred surrender. And so they used to just literally deter. You see, deter, the word terror is in deter. But they, pr pr they preferred to deter combat. And uh, if they didn't, then they would end up fighting. So, Now, here is a Zouave band. This is in New York, and these are all Americans. The Americans actually thought that those... And this is where we get all these nice designs on military jackets. That all comes from Islamic embroidery because they thought it was so amazing. They really liked the way that the soldiers dressed. And also the rankings come from the Ottomans. The Ottomans have given us an immense amount that we still do not uh, recognize, unfortunately, although that is changing. Now, um, these were the uniforms of the Zouaves on both sides of the Civil War. And to this day, the Marine... Uh, the Marine sword is a Mamluk sword. It's actually a Muslim sword that the Marine officers wear. Um, this, I call this the American Taliban, right? And th these are actually <laughs> American soldiers, right? So, and this is my really favorite contribution because we like to think that it's Hobbes and Locke that introduced tolerance into the Western world. Um, but the truth is, we have to really examine that proposition because Hobbes was no doubt influenced by the Ottomans. He has correspondence with Henry Stubb, who wrote The Rise and Progress of Mohammedanism, a book that Hobbes no doubt had read, uh, which describes very clearly how Muslims had solved the problem of religious intolerance by tolerating all different, not just sects within the same religion, but actually other religions by giving them their own civil courts and things like this. And then he says uh, also uh, Locke. When, you know, when I read John Locke's uh, biography, I got struck by this because I went through a period I read Locke and I was interested in uh, the, the uh, intellectual origins of, of American society. Well, what I found was that John Locke, they said probably the most influential individual on John Locke's life was a man that was quoted earlier, Edward Pocock, who was the teacher at Oxford of Arabic and Islamic studies. And he was a teacher of Locke. And we know also that the very first edict uh, of toleration, which occurs in the, in the 17th century in Budapest, was done by a Transylvanian Unitarian ruler who was directly under the suzerainty of the Ottoman Empire. And he was basically applying the very same policies that the Ottomans uh, were using in their states. And he is the first one 
uh, to allow the Protestants could freely come into his land, Catholics. He was Unitarian, so obviously they had been persecuted. Um, now, what's really interesting to me also is that the, the Ottoman Muslims offered refuge for Protestants that were being persecuted under Catholic rule. And this is historical fact. They also offered refuge to the Jews. Many of the Jews in Sarajevo fled Spain from the Spanish Inquisition and went to Morocco. And there are many Spanish Jewish families in Morocco to this day. Vanunu, who's come uh, again back into the, uh, the limelight, Vanunu was born in Marrakesh in Morocco, probably from a Spanish-Jewish uh, family, a Sephardic Jew. So I love this picture. These are rabbis wearing Azhari uniform with the red turban, which is unusual for Muslims. But here they are. These are and there's the Torah. And, and the Quran says, we gave you the Torah, fiha hudan wa nur. In it is light and guidance. I mean, that's what the Quran says. In it is light and guidance, the Torah. The, the Quran says the gospel, in it is light and guidance. And, and this was the, the tr history of the Muslims. These are Yemeni Jews. This is an Iraqi Jew. Um, this is a Turkish Jewish woman. These are Yemeni Jews also. This is an Egyptian Christian woman. And the Coptic Christians, I have a text written at 200 years ago in which Imam Sawi says that he's so fed up of hearing Muslims, and this is before colonialism. He was so fed up of hearing Muslims saying, I wish I was a Jew or a Christian because of the perks that they had in the Ottoman uh, system. And they were treated very well, and many of them had, had uh, reached very high levels uh, of um, ranking within the Ottoman system. And I'll also remind you that Musha bin Mamun, who's probably the greatest Jewish rabbi in Jewish history, wrote largely in Arabic. He was the personal physician of Salahuddin al Ayyubi, who's known as Salahuddin, who conquers uh, Jerusalem from the Crusaders in 1187. So this is, I mean, this is it. This, is, this was the history. And that's why it's a tragedy today. I'm going I'm to finish this with this. Islam in the UK... And, and there they are, the Queen Mother wearing her hijab there. And, <laughs> and, and here, here's uh, Nassim. You know, I was with him one time, and I'm not dropping names or anything, but, but I was with him once in London, and uh, these English people came up to him and they said, oh, we'd really like your autograph. And so he turns to me and he, and he, and he said, oh, you want his autograph? And he said, he said, no, we want your autograph. He said, no, 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 he's, he's, people know him more than they know me. And they just looked at me like, you know, what is this guy? You know, you know and so I said, you know, I'm a lightweight back in America. <laughs> a lightweight. So here's the central mosque there. I mean, somebody came, they always confuse me. I know that Muslims all look alike, but... They're Muslims, can, well, Asians think all white people look alike, right? So uh, these uh, people come to me and they say, uh, why did you give up singing? Because they think I'm Cat Stevens. Because <laughs> I'm Yusuf, Hamza Yusuf, he's Yusuf Islam. So I, I, I say, well, I lost my voice. <laughs> so, I wouldn't have. But. And which reminds me about the music. I didn't mention to you that the Bo Diddley beat which is the source of rock and roll. And I didn't go into jazz. Jazz is a Mandingo word, which means energetic. It's something that's energized. Um, OK is also from West Africa. Woke, which means OK. Waha uh, in Moroccan. But what's interesting is the Bo Diddley beat, which you hear uh, a lot in early rock and roll, and Van Morrison, who's known for his na 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 na, that comes directly from a West African beat that was used for saying, La ilaha illallah, and you can take the Bo Diddley beat and it will always work perfectly to La ilaha illallah. And interestingly enough, the la 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 la, I mean, where does that come from? Fa la 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 la, la ilaha la illallah. <laughs> so, that's a, a, a North African um, way of singing, by the way. So, I just want to finish this by saying, a couple of things, and then we're done. I think I'm doing reasonably well on time. And I want to thank you for being patient with this because it's, it's rather long. But I want to finish by saying that what you, what you saw here is true. I didn't make any of that up. And, 
And I believe that Islam has had an incredible contribution to our civilization here. I am a Western person. I was born in the West. My ancestors are largely from Scotland and, believe it or not, from Yorkshire. Because Hanson, H-A-N-S-O-N, is a Northern English family. And so I am indeed uh, part, uh, partly from this part of the land. Um, I, I have Scottish, uh, probably about half Scottish, and then I'm quarter Greek and quarter English. Well, I am Western, and this is my civilization. But I am also a Muslim. And in becoming Muslim, I was exposed to a tradition that forced me to reassess my own tradition and to really look at my own history and to be honest. And I do not believe that I am presenting something that is simply uh, because I am a Muslim. I actually believe that I'm just simply being honest. And I really feel that we in the West need to be honest. We need to recognize the immense debt that this civilization has had on our lives. And it's more than just wonderful curry houses in England. It's something very deep and profound. And I believe that some of our highest ideals that come from Greece, that come from Rome, that come from uh, other places, I believe that many of them, in fact, come directly from the Islamic tradition. And I think that in some ways, we in the West have achieved certain aspects that even the early Muslims never dreamed of. I believe that we have achieved uh, societies that have some of the highest principles of Islam embedded in them. And I think Muslims need to recognize that. They need to recognize how far these societies have come. And I think that we ourselves as Muslims, and I'm speaking to the Muslims, we need to be able to admit that the caravan of civilization has moved to another part of the world. And that does not mean that we are excluded from it. But I think that we should again join it because it is our caravan as well. And we have as much right to be part of it as anyone else. And that is why each one of us is sharing countless human beings' contributions. Every time that we do anything that we do, there is somebody that did it before us with very rare exception. There is someone that did it before us. And we owe it to that person. We owe it to that civilization to be thankful for what they gave us. That includes all of the wonderful things that our culture share. And I really believe that, that we're living in a time that the philosophers and the prophets of the past only dreamed that their peoples would understand. We're trying to create societies where people are not judged by their color. We're trying to create so societies that really do recognize the inherent dignity of human beings irrespective of their race, of their creed, of their color. These are very, very profound religious and moral ideals that are really common knowledge now. And in the past, that was simply not the case. And we cannot allow those inherent barbaric tendencies within the worst of our own natures to pull us down and to dishonor the immense amount of blood that was shed in the past that we might breathe free, that we might live in greater dignity. So I really can't take that home any, any more than simply by saying we owe it to all of these people of the past to really honor what we have, to enhance it, and to share it with the rest of the world. And this is the month of our beloved prophet's birthday. And so I want to read to you a very short paragraph in conclusion of a beautiful English historian... <coughs> Samuel P. Scott, who said over a hundred years ago, the glories which invest the history of Islam may be entirely derived from the valor, the virtue, the intelligence, the genius of man. If this be conceded, the largest measure of credit is due to him who conceived its plan, promoted its impulse, and formulated the rules which ensured its success. In any event... If the object of religion be the inculcation of morals, the diminution of evil, the promotion of human happiness, the expansion of human intellect, if the performance of good works will avail in that great day when mankind shall be summoned to its final reckoning, it is neither irreverent nor unreasonable to admit that Muhammad was indeed an apostle of God. Thank you very much.
Jazakallah khair and Sheikh Hamza, and uh, thank you for bearing with us. Um, it is a very long lecture, but I hope everyone found it worthwhile uh, to stay throughout. And I would just like to say one of the words that comes to our mind uh, of this event was to break down stereotypes. And uh, there's a lot of confusion going on around in the Muslim world, but Muslims are non-Muslims. Muslims looking on TV, seeing themselves portrayed as uh, barbarians, and also with non-Muslims looking to the Muslims saying, is this all that Islam produces? I mean, Sheikh Hamza has given us a lot of food for thought, and I would urge uh, both Muslims and non-Muslims to go back and look into Islamic history uh, and see what fruits they produce and see the fruits that we're actually eating now. And it's the challenges for Muslims living in the West is to create something that our future generations um, have something to look for because everything that we're having now is what has gone before us. The question is, what are we leaving behind for our children? And what are we creating? What sort of identity are we creating in the West? Many Muslims, many Muslims come from the subcontinent, and they seem to be recreating back home here. But the challenge for Muslims is to create their own identity, a British Islamic, a British Muslim cult, uh, cultural identity here in the West. And this is something that is not new, or it's my own idea, but if you see Islam, how it spread across the world, it never Arabized. Islam wasn't Arabized. It took the best of the culture and it synthesized that with Islam. So I think that the British Muslims have a, have a lot to do. Before we all go, if, if I could just ask you just to bear with me for a few moments. The organizers of this event would like to thank the following people for their support. Alison, Alison Haskins, Lynn Ledbetter, Jane Tiller, Muhammad Ali, I guess not the boxer, um, and community networks. For anyone who is interested in Sheikh Hamza's further programs, um, he will be on question time this Thursday, normally at 10.30, but you'll have to check the channels. And also, he is um, scheduled to do uh, several more lectures. Uh, the, the one at the weekend will be in Banbury called um, Traditional Education in the Age of Terror. And there will be one on the 5th or the 6th of uh, uh, May. You can check the CUNY's website. You can check masood.co.uk and Amor Press. Uh, com for details. And I mentioned earlier, um, Sheikh Hamza set up an, academy, an, uh, an ac academy in America called Zaytuna. And they've actually producing, stopped producing a semi-annual journal. Um, this is the one that's just recently been uh, printed here. I believe it is available at the front in the bookstore. And also, something that is very interesting, uh, particularly to myself, living as Muslim in the West, is a, is a discussion called Islam and democracy. Is a clash of civilizations in, inevitable? And it's with Sheikh Hamza Yusuf and Noah Feldman. And this is quite an invigorating discussion talking about um, how, um, how, compatible is Islam, how compatible is democracy with Islam? And what are, you know, do they envisage a clash of civilizations? So if anyone's interested, these are available. And once again, thank you very much for your attendance, and thanks for Islam Foundation for um, making this program happen. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum.